our catechetical instruction today, um, based on Luther's explanation, fasting and bodily preparation are certainly fine outward training, but that person is truly worthy and well prepared for the Lord's Supper, who has faith in these words, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. But anyone who does not believe these words or doubts them is unworthy and unprepared, for the words for you require all hearts to believe. Being worthy and well prepared to receive the Lord's Supper involves believing the words given and shed. What is given and shed? Jesus' blood, body, and blood. In other words, worthiness involves believing that you are receiving Jesus' very body and blood. In the previous chapter, we mentioned that some believe that they receive only bread and wine, not Jesus' body and blood. To believe this is to contradict what Jesus himself says in the words of institution, and that makes one unprepared for the sacrament. Being worthy and well prepared also means believing the words for the forgiveness of sins. It means trusting Jesus' statement that this sacrament delivers grace. It is tempting, by design or thoughtlessness, to regard the supper simply as an exercise that Christians do to demonstrate their love for God or one another. But Jesus gives his supper to us to give us grace. It is for the forgiveness of sins. To believe that the supper focuses on something else is to contradict him and say, I'm coming for some other reason, not for forgiveness. This is to be unworthy and ill-prepared. Finally, being worthy and well-prepared also means believing the words for you. These two words hold a lot. To believe that the supper and its forgiveness are for you is to say, I need forgiveness because I am a sinner. Thus, to be worthy means to be repentant. To say, I don't need, want forgiveness, or to claim to a favored sin is to be unworthy. The words for you announce for better news, far better news. The forgiveness is for you. The devil will sometimes tempt you to believe that Jesus forgives others, but that you are unforgivable. But Jesus didn't say, for you, unless you're really bad. He died, on the, he died on the cross for all. He died on the cross for you. The forgiveness in the Lord's Supper is for you. To doubt that Jesus forgives you accuses him of being unwilling or unable to forgive. To believe that, to believe that is to be unworthy and ill-prepared. Therefore, to be worthy and well-prepared for the Supper is to be repentant of sin and to trust that Jesus gives you his body and blood for the forgiveness of your sins. All of this is the work of the Holy Spirit. To doubt your sinfulness, the Savior's presence, or His grace is to be unprepared. This is serious. St. Paul warns in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 and 28, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of, of concern, will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Mark the words well. Those who receive the supper in an unworthy manner do not just receive it to no effect, they receive it to their judgment. But those who are worthy and well prepared receive the forgiveness of sins. And where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also life and salvation. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for this evening takes us back to the Garden of Gethsemane from last week's uh, Passion History. And the account is from Luke 22, verses 49 to 51. And when those who were around him, Jesus' disciples, saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched the man, the man's ear, and healed him. This is the text. The Christian friend's hands are usually symbols of action. With our mouth we talk and announce our decisions, but usually it's our hands that help us carry out those decisions. We are reminded in the words of 1 John chapter 3, verse 18, Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Some of you know what I'm going to say next. That's what Bible scholars call an example of dialectical negation. The sense is, little children, let us not love only 
in word or talk, but also in deed and in truth. We have an expression, put your money where your mouth is. We can hardly think of doing anything without the use of our hands. Unfortunately, though, hands aren't always used for the proper purpose. That wasn't the case with Jesus, however. So far we have seen his hands used in humble service as he washed his disciples' feet and his hands folded in prayer to his heavenly Father. Tonight we take note of the fact that Jesus used those same hands to heal the ear of the high priest's servant. Jesus often used his hands to heal someone. Not all the miracles that are recorded for us in Scripture show that Jesus used his hands in performing miracles of healing, but some do, and quite a number of them are significant. For example, when Jesus came down from his Sermon on the Mount, a leper approached him and begged to be healed. We read in Matthew chapter 8, verse 3, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched the man, saying, I will be clean. The truly remarkable thing is that Jesus touched the man, since lepers were regarded as untouchable. It was against the ceremonial law to do what Jesus did, but Jesus did it anyway, because compassion demanded it. In that same chapter, Matthew, of Matthew, we again see Jesus' healing touch. There we're told that Peter's mother-in-law was ill with a fever. In verse 15, it says, he touched her hand and the fever left her. Then there is the familiar story of the raising of Jairus' daughter from the dead. Jesus went in and took the hand of this little 12-year-old, bringing her back to life. Many other examples of healing could be cited where Jesus used the touch of his hand, clearly indicating that the source of the healing came directly from him. Now we come to the last miracle that Jesus performed before he was crucified. It took place in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Judas had led the soldiers of the high priest in order to betray Jesus into their hands. During the commotion, the disciples asked Jesus, should we strike with the sword? And before Jesus had a, a, had a chance to answer, one of the disciples, John's Gospel reports that it was, who do you suppose, the impetuous Peter, of course, one of the disciples had already draw, drawn his sword and cut off the ear of the high priest's servant. No doubt this, the impulsive act would have put Peter as well as the rest of the disciples in serious jeopardy had Jesus, had Jesus not acted immediately to repair the damage. Without hesitation, Jesus went to the servant and touched his ear, and it was healed. Didn't take two weeks to take the stitches out either. The ear was healed immediately miraculously. Now there's something about this story that makes it different from all the rest that we've mentioned. I wonder whether you've noticed it. Think about it a moment. Of all the stories where Jesus used his touch to heal, this one is different. In all the previous miracles there was someone who believed in him, a friend or a relative of a friend. People favorably disposed for Jesus. But in this case, Jesus touched and healed an enemy. For by no stretch of the imagination could we say that anyone who came to capture him was his friend. Jesus here fulfills his own exhortation, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Isn't that just like our Savior? Even in the hour of bitter woe, he is the great benefactor, even of his enemies. Perhaps it brings to mind the words of St. Paul who said, While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. That says something to you and me, doesn't it? 
one of the things this ought to impress upon us is that we, if we're going to follow Jesus' example, certainly ought to extend our kindness not only to those who are good and kind to us, but to those who are unkind, unjust, and even discourteous. Jesus extended his love all the way around to everyone. He didn't condition his love on the positive response of those who were the objects of his love, nor did he wait for a favorable attitude from them before initiating his saving mission to mankind. Remembering again what St. Paul said, you and I need to put ourselves in the category, in the classification of enemies of God before we were converted, before we were reconciled and brought into a right relationship with God. By nature, all people are sinners, and by nature, all are rebellious against God. Jesus, nevertheless, still loved us and came to earth to suffer and die and heal us from the world's worst disease, that, the worst disease that has ever plagued mankind, the leprosy of sin. Just as the high priest's servant's ear was completely healed when touched by Jesus' hand, so also we are completely healed forgiven when he touches our hearts with his mercy. As this victim of Peter's sword didn't need to go back to get the stitches removed, so you and I don't need to make up for what Jesus didn't do. He left nothing undone. He paid the price completely. When he says we are forgiven on account of his taking our place and suffering the punishment which we deserve, we know we are forgiven. As we accept this forgiveness through faith, we know it's complete. When he heals us, we are perfectly healed. There is now no condemnation, as the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1, verse 7. The story of Christ healing the ear of the high priest servant would remind us that we should extend our love also to strangers and enemies. Why? Not only because that's what Christ did, but also because by doing so we will be letting our light so shine before men that they may see our good works, not to praise us, but to praise our Father who is in heaven. With the deeds of kindness that we do, we can, that we can do with our hands, we may cause others to seek out Christ, who alone can really heal them, bodily and spiritually. As someone once said, love them until they ask us why. This is what attracted a couple from my vicarage congregation to the church. They noticed the steady stream of church volunteers who came to provide the physical therapy needed by a young child in the house next door. It was hard work, demanding work, as the volunteers manipulated, used their hands, manipulated the child's palsied arms and legs. This couple was so impressed that they wanted to know more about these people and what motivated them. And eventually, as I said, they became members of Hope Lutheran Church. <clears throat> Perhaps you recall reading or hearing about a statue of Christ in a town that was bombed out during the Second World War. The townspeople wanted to have the statue uh, restored because it had both hands blown off. Hands of Jesus, blown off. But then they decided not to restore it, but to leave it just as it was, thereby leaving it as a reminder to all Christians that they must be the hands of Christ. Christ has no hands on earth today, but our hands. It's up to you and me to let him heal others through us. Some of them may say, though, I'm no match for Jesus. I can't do the complete job. 
If I could only touch someone and they'd be instantly healed, oh, that would be great. But because we can't do everything, there's no excuse for doing nothing. Far too often we focus our attention on what we can't do rather than look at what we can do. First and foremost, we can pray for their healing. <clears throat> We have God's promise that the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Isn't that addressed to each one of us who have been made righteous in God's sight on account of what Jesus has done for us? Isn't that addressed to us when we pray in the name of and in the faith of Jesus our Savior? Lift up your prayers then. For those who are sick. I know we do it on a Sunday morning, but we do it, need to do that as well throughout the week, not only for those on our prayer list, but of course others as well. The other small thing that we can do toward healing the sick is to visit them. Our visits may consist of little more than listening to them, but that can be one of the most significant means of reaching out to them. By listening to them, we are showing that we care about them and how we feel, and uh, care about them and how they feel. German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his book Life Together, describes listening this way. The first service that one owes to others in the fellowship consists in listening to them. Just as love to God begins with listening to his word, so the beginning of love for the brethren is learning to listen to them. By listening to others, we are sharing their burden, and we also find out how we can help them in other ways. All this is a contribution toward their healing. Listening is just one way to cultivate a relationship through which the Holy Spirit can work. One final example. This time from St. Paul's Coffee Bill, where it was not uncommon for me to make a hospital visit, only to find that Harold, I won't use his last name, Harold, had been there before me. <clears throat> the feedback that I got from the people I was visiting always po was always positive. His visits were appreciated. Harold had no official position in the church that required him to do so. I never asked him to do so, but he did so, out of the love of Jesus. Yes, it would be wonderful if, like Jesus, we could heal the sick instantly with the touch of our hand. But since the Lord hasn't granted us this kind of healing power, let's not say that there is nothing we can do. We can do something. We can touch the lives of others in whatever ways God makes available to us. Let's do what we can with prayers and visits and other practical help in accordance with the wishes of our Lord and Master whose healing hands have reached down to touch us lovingly and graciously with physical and spiritual healing. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.